uh, we'll head to the book of Genesis chapter number one to uh, think a little bit about how we think about and describe one another. Because the truth of the matter is, uh, if we all were given a truth pill or uh, our own conversations were bugged 24 hours a day, seven days a week, uh, some of us may have some descriptions of other people that we would be embarrassed that everyone else would hear. It. Somebody, any honest folk in here today? Amen. I'm not asking for everybody to be honest, just a few of y'all. Praise God. And, and some of the reason uh, that I think some of this is so powerfully persisting in our culture and in our country is because we have forgotten some very foundational ideas and principles, particularly we who are followers of Jesus, that I hope we uncover uh, today and that you will continue to explore in your groups. Uh, so the title of today's sermon is simply going to be Image Bearers. Uh, image bearers. Turn with me again, Genesis chapter 1, verse 26. I am reading from the message translation uh, only because I like the freshness of how it reads, but any of the translations that you use, um, as long as it is not the, go the gospel according to you, put your name in front of it, amen, uh, but as long as it's you know, connected to the, these, these, these sacred texts we have, uh, I think you'll be in good shape. Verse number 26 is where I'll start. Uh, and this is one of the two creation stories or narratives that we find in the book of Genesis. It's always important to appreciate uh, that when you take a look at how Genesis uh, actually kind of came together from uh, its origins. These are creation uh, stories and records uh, that uh, the priests and then other historians actually told the story of how God created the world in the beginning. And their emphasis was not intended to be scientific. Uh, their emphasis was intended to be uh, something much more deep and profound. It was always intending to help you and I never forget that the trajectory of who we have been created for and toward and why we have been created is toward someone or something that is utterly transcendent than anything you could imagine. So don't get too caught up in the you know, scientific arguments uh, that some folk feel very compelled to fight. Amen. Uh, because uh, the Bible is not meant to be a scientific book. Although it does have, I think, some contributions to every discipline uh, it is not intended. It was not written uh, with a, uh, 21st century science in mind. Amen. But there are some eternal truths that were true back then and they true today. Amen. Because when God speaks, how I many know God, God, God ain't hung up on our limited knowledge? Amen. Give your neighbor a high five and tell him you limited. Amen. That's all right. You limited. But, you know, that's a good thing. Amen. It's good to be limited. So Genesis chapter 1 verse 26 God spoke and he said, let us make human beings in our image. Everybody say image. image. Make them reflecting our nature. Everybody say nature. nature. So they can be responsible for the fish in the sea, the birds in the air, the cattle, and yes, earth itself. And every animal that moves on the face of the earth. God created human beings, created them godlike, reflecting God's nature, created them male and female. God blessed them, prosper, reproduce, fill the earth, take charge, be responsible for every living thing that moves on the face of the earth. It's quite some assignment that God gives us, amen? Verse 29, then God said, I've given you every sort of seed bearing plant on earth, every kind of fruit bearing tree, given them to you for food, to all animals and all birds, everything that moves and breathes. I give whatever grows out of the ground for food, and there it was. God looked over everything he had made. It was so good, so very good. It was evening, it was morning, 
day six. It's the word of God for us, the people of God. Let us say thanks be to God. So we're going to speak uh, from the topic today, uh, image bearers. Uh, bow your heads with me. Let's take a few moments to ask the blessings of God on our preaching time. Lord, we thank you for the gift of your word that is a lamp unto our feet and the light unto our path. We ask you, God, to send the anointing that makes preaching and teaching easy. Let it rest upon me and even the hearers of this word and cause us to grow and be who you've called us to be, your church in the world. In Jesus' name we pray. Let the people of God say amen. amen. <clears throat> Somebody say, I am, I am. an image bearer. image bearer. Tell your neighbor next to you, you are, you are. an image bearer. image bearer. Now, I know... Uh, Many of you have been super excited about, you know, the buildup for this day. I know, you know, last week was such an amazing experience for many of you that were, you know, engaging in some of these uh, build-up activities, and, and uh, it is a great day, amen, uh, for us to uh, be experiencing uh, one of the most important, uh, I think, days of the week, and some, you know, some will say days of the year. Um, are you ready for some football? Praise God. Amen. It's definitely, no, y'all not. Well, today is the first day of the Sunday football season, and I know many of y'all, amen, are very excited about that. Uh, I, 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 I want to be, but there is something that is uh, really killing all of my excitement. And uh, that's because my coach, a man coached yesterday, the Michigan Wolverines, praise God, to a nice victory. And we get, you know, somebody else that's trying to help us win uh, on the 49ers. But I'm praying that some of y'all other teams will win today uh, in the name of the Lord. It's so fascinating, though, that uh, when my team was winning, I would usually, many of you know, start off the Sunday in my 49er jersey, amen, uh, bearing the winning image of the San Francisco 49er franchise. And isn't it interesting that when you're winning, uh, no, everyone likes to be associated with winning. Uh, you, no shame in wearing uh, any paraphernalia, any kind of thing that will help you be uh, associated or reflective of a winner. And uh, certainly, I guess, uh, all of the teams are starting out uh, with uh, no losses. So I guess by de facto, you know, this could have been your only chance. Amen. <laughs> uh, but, you know, one of the fascinating things about that image is when you are winning, how many of you know there are great expectations that are often attached to winning? There is a reputation that often precedes and follows a winner. Someone who is deemed to have a certain kind of legacy, if you will. Now, part of what I believe you and I must always be reminded of is that we are here not because of the power of our own selves. Certainly, some of us are, you know, more uh, silver spooned than others, praise God. Um, Y'all know what silver spoon means, so you're born with a silver spoon in your mouth. You know, there was a show back in the day, wow, I'm really dating myself, it was called Silver Spoon. Anybody remember that show, Silver Spoon? All right, thank God for about 10 folk who are over the age of 40 up in here, praise the Lord. Amen. But, you know, it was a show about a young, young people who's just, you know, born, you know, rich and wealthy, et cetera. And how many know when you have that kind of a silver spoon legacy, you do have a head start on everybody else? I mean, this is what privilege is all about. Amen. That in a society where certain folks have certain advantages uh, that you did not ask for, you did not earn, it does give you some privilege. And unless we think that all privilege is only grounded in race, how many of you know that, you know, if you are left-handed, then uh, you probably don't have as much privileges as folk who are right-handed? This was told to me by someone because I am right-handed. 
But they were like, when I go into a desk to try to sit down, you know those old school desks, do they still have them desks where they had a little thing on the front? Amen. It is designed for right-handed people. So the left-handed folk, I'm told, get arthritis all in their back and they just all uncomfortable because they're trying to like cross over and, you know, take notes. And I just be like, man, it's a hard knock life, praise God. <laughs> or if you are a man, you know, we men have privileges that, that we did not ask for. Well, some folk maybe do be asking for it and be trying to keep it, amen, as much as they possibly can. But our sisters, amen, don't, don't, don't get the male privilege that many of us have. So privilege is, is something that all of us must be aware of. Uh, and then we must figure out how then do we live in such a way where we are not ourselves using our privilege as a way to hurt other people. Now, when we talk about the church then, we are privileged, listen, to be the chosen people that God has designated to accelerate and participate in the redemption of the world. We talked a little bit about this last week, right? That we are his ministers of reconciliation. That God says through us he is redeeming the world. Now that is quite some privilege that out of all the jacked up folk in the world, God decided to use me. I don't know uh, if you are aware of your jack up uh, Maybe that's the problem because some of us think that we, you know, we are the reason, amen, why God created everything. Uh, for our pleasure. But how many of you know that depending on what day of the week and what time of the day, we are part of the problem? I wish I had an honest church in here today. So this truth and this reality must always be upon us that the church, we are called to a special assignment and it is a privilege. But we must not use the privilege of being the church to forsake our assignment, our specific instructions, or our relationship with God as a way to demean, dehumanize, or exclude that who God has called according to God's own words, good. Mm -hmm. So now, how many of you know not everything we do is good? So it is not a declaration about your actions. It is a declaration about your being. That when you are created by God, as soon as God helped put all that magic together, you good. Ooh. Some of us can go our whole life and not believe that we are good. Some of that's because some of us parents, we don't tell our children enough. We haven't been told enough ourselves. You ever been around some folk, I'm not talking about your parents, <laughs> who just always point out, ooh, they so bad, you say a name, ooh, <laughs> they are bad. You ever, you, you, hopefully you weren't the one doing it. Saying name, oh look at Johnny, you know Johnny, ooh, he is bad. How me know when you hear that your whole life, you will begin to believe that you are what you do. And I'm not saying that ain't some folk out here who's a piece of work, praise God. Because you're a piece of work and I'm a piece of work, we all a piece of work. I preach that before, right? For all you the one here, just pat yourself on the chest and say, I am a piece of work. Just say that. I am a piece of work. <laughs> but I believe that at every moment in our life when we are inhaling the opportunity to exhale, that God is still looking at the original kernel of our existence and saying, reminding God's self, mm, that was some good work in creating that brother, that sister. So the church must be in the business of constantly reminding 
I believe this world and one another that we are good. Last week I had a slide up there about be the church and, uh, you know, it had a couple of things up there. Be the church, protect the environment, care for the poor, forgive often, reject racism, fight for the power to share earthly and spiritual resources, embrace diversity, love God and enjoy this life. This week I put together another one that I think is just as important to describe how we can be the church. It says bear God's image. Steward creation, create life, make disciples, spirit led, overcome evil with good, exist in community, worship God, embrace the other, live nonviolently. Now I could spend a whole series on each one of those by themselves. But part of what I thought was important is for the rest of our time in the series of being the church, it's important for you and I to get real clear about what we are being asked and called to do. I think all of these principles and, and descriptions of who we must be as the church are deeply grounded in scripture and in the tradition of our faith. So it is not these kinds of, you know, uh, 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 contemporary descriptions. Amen. We are living into the winning legacy of the body of Christ. So while, as I stated earlier, you know, everybody is running out there uh, on the field today on opening day for the football season, uh, and they are, you know, hoping they have a good year, uh, we already know that this church, the body of Christ, Jesus said the gates of hell will not prevail against this church. What do you think about that for a second? Amen. What greater winning team to be on than the team that not even the gates of hell. Lord, have mercy. Amen. That's, 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 that, that's some formidable opponent. But Jesus said from the beginning, these gates will not be able to prevail against it. That means that even the idiosyncrasies within the church will not be the downfall of the church. Our inconsistency, our hypocrisy, our unfaithfulness, our limited ability to continue to expand our notion and ideas of what it means to faithfully be the church. Because how many of you know there are times in the church's history where we failed to be the church? But I'm always glad that there's always a remnant. Y'all know what a remnant is? There's always a, that's a nice, that's a nice old school King James Version word. Amen. There's always some holdouts. Some folk who are left over, you know, like, like, you know, uh, uh, Thanksgiving is what, about six weeks away, eight weeks, amen, thank the Lord, praise God, and, 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 and how many know the best part of Thanksgiving is the leftovers, touch your neighbor, somebody, amen, and it, it, it is, it is that which is left over, it reminds you, oh, Jesus, of something good that happened. Well, there's always a remnant within the church at every age that is to remind us that we are called to bear the image of God. And I'm so glad that this is the great gift of the church because people feel like, well, the church is this and the church is that and all the time about the church ain't. And I'd be like, well, you know, um, the church is imperfect because you're here. <laughs> Amen. Let's not get it twisted. Soon as I walked in the door, the, the, the value of the church took a dot. It's like, woo. But the value of the church is not based on us. Just like the assignment of the church is not based on us. We have been given instructions on how we are to be the church. And our task then is to live out those instructions 
every day, struggling as we may be. It gives us instruction on how we are to be as a family. It gives us instruction on how we are to be as a citizen. It gives us instruction on how we are to be as a follower and as a disciple. It gives us instruction on how we are to be as children, as, as parents, as, as citizens in an earthly kingdom and citizens in a heavenly kingdom. Being the church is not left up to your own job description that you develop. Amen. We're called to be faithful. I was uh, speaking at an event and they introduced me as an activist clergy. And I, and I you know, I bristled a little bit because, you know, so when I got up to speak, I said, you know, I appreciate, you know, I think that's a compliment, amen, that you, you know, call me activist clergy. But real talk, I'm just a follower of Jesus right. trying to be faithful. So we must make sure that we don't fall into trying to fit descriptions of the world at the expense of us being faithful to what God's called us to be. Because if you're faithful to what God calls you to be, you won't fit in any box that the world tries to describe. You can't be a good Democrat and be the church. You can't be a good Republican and be the church. You can't be a good progressive, a good conservative, a good capitalist, a good socialist. You can't be a good black person, a good white person, a good gay person, a good straight person. You can't be a good U.S. American. You can't be a good Afghanistan. You can't be a good anything that the world would describe and be ultimately faithful to the gospel. So every label you want to put on yourself, you better just understand that that label is insufficient because we are called to be the church. Touch your neighbor and tell them I'm called. We're called to be the church. So if we take a look then uh, uh, of some of these descriptions that I think are helping us to be the church, the, the, the first thing that the text we read today, the book of Genesis, admittedly it is not talking about narrowly what it means to be the church, but it is the theological description of the origins of humanity according to the church. All right? And the first thing that I believe the scriptures declare as a foundational principle for how we who are being the church must see one another is that we are created in the image of God. Everybody say that. Created, Created in the image of God. Verse 26, it says, let us make human beings in our image, make them reflecting our nature. Now, this idea that you and I have been created in the image of God has very deep implications for us, far beyond uh, just this kind of... Uh, uh, you know, spiritual, uh, 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 what's, what's the word I'm looking for? Uh, 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 cliche. You know, sometimes we can, we can be in church and just be, live our lives off of cliches and don't really dig deep on what does it really mean? What is that stake that you are now creating the image of God? That we are reflect, we are created to reflect the nature of God. Now, for some of us, because we've had lots of horrible experiences with God or the church, this is not a good starting point. And I want to name that, all right? Because it's hard to start from a place of tension and then move to a place of learning and knowledge. But I want you to just to trust that we're going somewhere, all right? Because I think that the failure is not in God. All right. This is just my assumptions, my foundation. And, you know, so and, I, and, that, and that is with great, great bias that I say that. Right. That my life has shown me that God loves me and God means the best for me. Even when I don't mean the best for myself. And there are certain things that happen that I may attribute to God or that God may actually allow to happen that in the moment is the most painful and hurtful thing that I could ever imagine. I, I create space for all that. 
But I found the longer that I live, God resolves things. God takes the things that were meant to destroy me, and somehow I come out with some different kind of strength. Different kind of capacity. I know some of you are like, well, how come God just couldn't give me that without the trial? I'm, I'm like that. I ask God that all the time. Like, did I really need that whooping? Amen. I mean, you know, but then I remember that I was told the truth. <laughs> At least 10, 50 times. Like, you know, my, my daughters, bless their heart, they got me all in them, and I feel so bad. Because <laughs> I sound like my dad and my mom now, you know. I mean, you know, my dad used to, you know, tell us not to do stuff. Don't do it. Yes, daddy. My, my, my daughter, I said, Sarai? She said, yeah. <laughs> and, that thing just bothered me so bad. Yeah. I said, come here, Sarai. And, she, and I was telling my dad, when I call you, you say, yes, daddy. <laughs> What's this? Yeah, like I'm one of your friends. Like, yeah. You know? Oh, I just feel so bad for these kids. Hey, Amen. They, they, they just hard headed. I told them, you gonna have a hard time in this house. You know, just channeling my dad. She has my nature. There's characteristics in her that she had that she didn't even have a chance. <laughs> To say, I don't want that, <laughs> you know? <laughs> well, don't you know that when you and I are created collectively as creation, we are reflecting the image of God. It is not that you by yourself reflect the image of God. All encompassing yourself. That the fullness of the image of God resides in Michael McBride. No, that's not what the scripture is saying. We, humankind, created the image of God. That means that we need one another. We need to be in relationship with as many folk as we can. So we can get the opportunity to experience the fullness of the image of God. Now, in our culture, how many old folk are always trying to separate us from one another? So I feel like, well, you know, God must be black. You know, God must be white. God must be rich. God must be American. God must be this. And, and then we, we, we create God in our image <laughs> rather than we being created in the image of God. And understand, any time you talk about God, I appreciate my rabbi friends, we were having a conversation about this. They said, any language you use to speak about God is already a demotion. <laughs> Amen. So just the act itself of us trying to explain what God is, who God is, is already demeaning God. But it's okay. This is why we worship God. The act of worship actually gets us into right alignment. So we can't speak more clearly and be shaped by the image of God. So this bearing the image of God is so important because there are many places in the world where we as the church are being asked to bear the image of God collectively. All right? And if we can't fulfill that assignment, then God will always be to the world, those who are looking for God, seeing impartiality in as much as it's within our power. So there is a great responsibility for we, the ministers of reconciliation that we're talking about. Being the church means that we must take seriously that we are created in the image of God and we must then bear God's image. There are a lot of different ways that we can describe who God is. And, and this, 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 this thing has God, and there's all kind of things. God is our shield. God is our counselor. God is our comforter. God is our provider. God is our preserver, our defender, our redeemer, our advocate. I mean, this is a good list. And one of the great things about being created in the image of God is that 
God, who God is, is also who God is asking us to learn him to be. And then how can we that are reflecting the image of God be this ourselves? So think about who do we need to be a shield for in the world? Who do we need to comfort in the world? Because we are creating the image of God. We, we are reflecting God's nature. You can't be uh, created in the image of someone and then don't look like them at all. I mean, how many of y'all, you know, this is going to be a crude example. I don't mean no harm. <laughs> but, you know, how many of y'all watch them Maury Povich shows and they, you know, you are the father. You are not the father. And, you know, uh, you know, <laughs> just, just go away for a second. You know, they, they, they put the pictures of the babies up there on the screen and everybody, like, oh, yeah, that's, that's, that's he is. Why? Because. Look just like him. Same nose, same eyes, same ears. The image, it reflects it. But if we are reflecting the image of God, and we are the opposite of who God is. Ooh, I'm not, I'm not, I'm not, I'm not telling you that you not, you know in the church or be in the church I'm just telling you I don't know I think we must reflect God's image we must reflect who God is y'all follow me on this yeah. being the church means that at some some point in your week in your life you got to you got to be able to to, to be an advocate for somebody because God is an advocate for you. Yes. You got to be able to, to, to defend some folk, to guide some folk, to help deliver some folk. Because this is natural of who it is, means to be God and we are creating the image of God. I use this quote all the time. At the nation's North African church father, he says that son of God became human so that we could become like God. The process theologians call divinization. And the reason why Jesus came was so we could become like him. Amen. And it is so important that as we pray and disciple and are shaped in our formation, that we are becoming and reflecting the image of God that we have been given the capacity to reflect. It must be intentionality. It, it don't happen on accident. But I believe we can live up to it and live into it. Amen. In the name of the Lord. Amen? Amen. Second thing that I believe this, this text helps us to appreciate uh, in Genesis chapter 1. We must live in community. So image bearers live in community. Everybody say that, live in community, live in community. That means that part of what it means to be the church is that you lose the ability to be your radically individualistic self, which is the mode of being in post-modernity. Emmanuel Kant, categorical, imperative, Roboto, Foucault, uh, Derrida, you know, all them folk you study at Cal, UC Berkeley, etc. You know, Stanford, Mills, San Francisco State, East Bay. <coughs> that, 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 that being a follower of Jesus means that you don't get to just be your own authority. Now, I know for some of us. Well, Pastor, this is my last Sunday here with you because I just, I just can't, I can't. I just can't. I, I, you know, I got the, you know, I'm, a, I'm, a, I'm my own person. Well, I'm not hating on you being your own person. Sort of, kind of. What I am saying is when everyone is their own person, literally, there's a great book, uh, Alistair McIntyre says, 
uh, oh, big bride. Uh, oh. <laughs> whose faith? Whose rationality? This, it's a, it's a, it's a very fascinating book about the perils of living out of community, right? Because many of us can do what is right in our own eyes. And it always feels good until it don't. Right. <laughs> All right. oh, thank you, Jesus. So part of why we must live in community is it helps us to have accountability, helps us to have, you know, uh, uh, a, a way of seeing and being that is beyond our limitations. Now, this, this is fascinating because in the life of God, the way we understand God, uh, the early church fathers and mothers say, when we say God, we mean Father, Son, Holy Spirit. And they're very clear about uh, the, these passages. They called it the royal consciousness. When God speaks in uh, Genesis, let us make human beings in our image, it is speaking, according to the early church uh, uh, fathers and mothers, to a kind of, 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 of communal life within the Godhead. Now, they are not like radically individuals, meaning like the father one day want to do something, and the son is over here on the other side saying, ah, but I want to go this way. And the Holy Spirit is on this other side saying, but wait a minute now, the Spirit is leading me this way. <laughs> It ain't that kind of party, praise God. That within the life of the Godhead, the communal life, it is called perichoresis. It is this, this way of talking about the interdependence of God within God's self. That God willingly lives in community with God's self so as to reflect this necessity even in our own human relationships. That we necessarily must be in relationship with other people. At the end of the day, part of what it means to be human is to be in relationship with other people. But when we pull back and just go into our own places of isolation, right? And you meet folk like this, they've been hurt, you've been hurt, I've been hurt. And then it's like, well, I don't need nobody. I don't need nobody. Just me, myself, and I. Aren't they the most abrasive folk you ever meet? Those kind of folk. I mean, they, you know, they can't receive love, can't really give love. When you're not living in community, your capacity to give and receive becomes greatly diminished. And part of what the church is called to do is to freely give that which God has freely given to us. So all of us in here who have an aversion to living in community, I want to argue to you that you are limited. We are limited in being the church when we can't live in community one with another. I love this verse. As iron sharpens iron, so does another friend, another person sharpen one another. Right? There's a benefit for us living in community. And again, living in community ain't just about you coming to church on Sunday. But throughout the week, you ought to find you some folk who are helping you be the best God version of you. Because how many know there's a devil version? <laughs> Ooh, there he is. There he is. There he is. You ain't got the lie, Craig. Amen. <laughs> There's a version of you, and some of you don't need no help with that version, right? It's like, oh, this is just who I'm born to be. Amen. <laughs> but you need to find some folk who can help bring the God in you out. And that don't happen just by you hanging out, you know, doing uh, 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 neutral activities. You need to have some folk who can pray with you. Study this word with you. Serve the world together. Get on a good eating plan, workout plan, non-gossiping plan. <laughs> Amen. 
iron sharpening iron. If you live in community, if we live in community, I believe, we'll be able to do this next thing, which is my last point, be life givers. To me, this is the last point, one of the last most powerful things that the church is called to do. If it is indeed the case that at the beginning God created that one of the most critical and important functions of God's work in the world and then Jesus comes a second time and creates a new path to salvation and then the Spirit comes and creates the mechanism for the church to live and thrive in the world. Can you imagine what our role as the church is to be in the world? Being a life giver. I know that some folk don't like church because, you know, we're always quick to send folk to hell. Ooh, hell is hot. And you on your way there. Hey Amen. You know, you going to bust hell wide open. I just, you know. We quit. Everybody, you know, how many met folks like that? They always know who's going to hell, boy. I mean, it's just like, you got a roster, huh? Is my name on that list? I hope not. <laughs> I, I, thought, I thought I asked God for forgiveness on that one. All right, let's just quickly, let's just, can you, you pray with me real quick? No, you going to hell. <laughs> We know that God don't want anybody to perish. Wow, I thought I'd just get some. Woo! Focus like. <laughs> Ain't that something, right? Some of us don't even believe that. Some of us feel like, no, God. God, he, 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 he created hell just for you. This is this. I'm gonna say something pretty radical. I remember after 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 uh, 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 United States went in and and overthrew Saddam Hussein, and there was this big old, you know, of course the Sunday morning programs. Everybody was talking about how, you know, it's a great day for America, and and you know, um, you know, uh, it was just going on and on. And then the very next question, they moved it to religion, and they just started to have this debate about, you know. Uh, which candidate was a more faithful follower of Jesus. And it was so fascinating because in one breath you are <laughs> celebrating the death of someone, and the next breath you competing over who is a better Christian because of some, I don't know, I don't know what they was arguing about that day. Had to be an abortion or gay marriage, because you know that's pretty much the litmus test, amen, <laughs> uh, for, for both sides. Ain't that fascinating, amen. Uh, but, 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 I, I, I said, at the time, I said, you know, if we really believe that these kind of, you know, uh, uh, non-Christian, quote-unquote, folk go to hell and eternally separate from God when they die, would we celebrate their death? Or would we weep? that we failed in helping bring them into relationship with God. Amen. If we really believe this stuff, that's why, you know, part of what I, I want us to wrestle with about being a church is we can't just get on everybody else's bandwagon about what they celebrating and what they critiquing and stuff when, when you know, we called to give life. Amen. We're not called to put nobody in hell. Nor put nobody in heaven. I hope everybody goes to heaven. But you better not let, let McBride's word be your final word. Because, you know, I'm hoping to get there just like you. <laughs> I don't got no keys. I don't give me no money and expect no help. That, that's that not going to help either. You got to have a relationship with God that can carry you into eternity. But that relationship starts today. It don't start when you get to eternity. See, I believe that part of what life-giving ministry and relationships are about is that we must be able, as I said, started very early on, God looked at what he created and said it was good. How do we make sure that what we are creating 
we can look at it and say, this was a good contribution. Wherever we are, in your relationships, at home, on your job, in the neighborhood, in your own life, don't create drama. And things that are tearing away at who God created you to be. Amen. I know it's hard. Some of us, we, we, we are drama. Praise God. We just a bundle of drama. But that's why we need to be saved. Yes. Amen. We need Jesus to save us. Jesus said it like this in John chapter 16 or chapter 10 verse 10. I come that you might have life. And if Jesus come in that you could have life and have it abundantly, have it to the full, why do you think Jesus wants you to be filled with life? So you can be overflowing life into the lives of other people. Whatever you're full of, when you get squeezed, <laughs> it's going to come back. So you better be full of some life. Hello, somebody. Be full of life. This is what we are called to do and be as the church. Now this series, we're, we're going to keep trying to press and move through this because I know that there are lots of things that we have to wrestle with if we're going to really be the church. I know there's some folk in here who aren't even really believers and y'all just, you know, hanging out because, you know, you like the environment or you like me or you like the sister or brother sitting next to you. I don't know. Uh, but, 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 but I want you to be clear that there is a place for all of us in the life of God. Amen. Amen. When the scripture says, it is by love and kindness I have drawn you, God had to draw us. You didn't wake up one day and all of a sudden, <laughs> me and God, me and Jesus, hallelujah. How many of you still being drawn by God right now? I mean, it's like God kind of got a hook in our lip and we just fighting it. And, and God's like, no, just come. It's okay. It's okay for you, for you to be having some questions and some, some you still a part of the church if you got questions. You still part of church if you fail and mess up. You still part you like you got to do a lot for God to like throw you away. Right. Amen. Amen. You, you got to do a lot, and I, you know I hope I'm not there yet. And uh, you know I don't think too many of y'all are there yet either. So take the edge off of it, and and think about your life as formation, development. We are being, becoming, being transformed into the image and likeness of God in Christ Jesus. Let's be the church. Stand with me, everyone. Come on. Come on.